All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to uh, this Law Hour slash James Lishman Expert in Residence Lecture. Um, our guest of honor is Mandy Woodland. She's a Dow alumni, graduated in 2006. Um, she is a reformed corporate lawyer and molecular biologist um, who is now the CEO and founder of Jellyfish. Yes? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to let Mandy take it from here and explain kind of what she does and what her, her everyday looks like. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So I want to talk a bit about career paths and opportunities and entrepreneurship, but mostly about why lawyers should or shouldn't be entrepreneurs. Um, so why me? I obviously come from Dow Law. Um, I'm currently the entrepreneur in residence at an organization called Bounce Health Innovation. And our goal is to increase the number of med tech startup companies in Newfoundland and Labrador. I have a Master's of Technology, Entrepreneurship, and Innovation, which was uh, post-law school. And as you mentioned in my bio, I was a molecular biologist and a lawyer, and I'm also a business coach. Um, and so I come to that from an interesting path. So how many people here came to law school from a business degree? Show of hands. Okay. <laughs> Technically. Um, Everyone who didn't come from business, what did you study before you did law? Just shout it out. Science? Poli sci, science, engineering. We do like humanities. Public relations. Public relations. Awesome. English lit, there you go. So when we talk about paths, pre law school um, is the same as post law school in terms of the number of paths available to you. Um, Every single piece of your background and who you are will lead you to where you're going. And of course, um, sometimes you can better solve the problems you want to solve as an entrepreneur than you can as a lawyer. So what do we think about when we think about lawyers? Um, the stereotype is obviously very um, buttoned down, typically very driven by precedent, not very comfortable with risk very reactive, not very innovative. Lawyers are in the 90th percentile for skepticism, not particularly surprising. And also, research has shown that lawyers have the lowest resilience or the least amount of ability to bounce back or deal with a setback of any profession, which is kind of surprising because we have to go through a lot to kind of get to law school, to get through law school, and apparently we're not very good at bouncing back. When we think of entrepreneurs, we think of this different environment, right? Working from a coffee shop, kind of remote working in some cases. We think of people who are visionaries, who are good at execution and collaboration, and who are passionate about they, what they do, and always like a little bit of madness. So I always say like, this is my favorite like workshop of me because as an entrepreneur, you have to be a little bit crazy. So law degrees in history were a very, um, financially stable, secure, socially acceptable path to a very respectable career. And you have this clear path. So when I graduated, which seems like yesterday, but it was 12 years ago, and I didn't come to law school until I was older, um, this, was a, this was a path. And this is what success looked like. You went to law school, you articled, wrote your bar exam, you became an associate in a firm, you paid your dues, and then when I started, it was you worked for six years as an associate and then you became a partner. That was it. If you were halfway decent, that's what that looked like. You got a partnership at a big firm or a small firm or you became an in-house counsel. Um, and that path was very specific. Lawyers traditionally controlled all facets of their market and we still do to some extent. So education, licensing, practice standards, ethics, delivery, um, insurance regulations, so a bit unique in terms of the professions in that kind of start to finish control and regulation of, of what we do. And what we sold and sell is legal expertise. So by design, law has been exclusionary. And I'm sure you've all, whether it came from before law school or since you've been here, um, heard over and over about issues with access to justice, issues with diversity and tolerance in the profession. Um, we have made it seem, historically, that 
only a very few are qualified to solve these challenges. As lawyers, we often solve business challenges that we classify as legal to keep things within that um, realm of our control. Lawyers crafted language, procedures, a very insular and homogenous culture to differentiate ourselves from the rest of society. And this delivery of legal services was very contained. So it was really important that nobody else could practice anything called legal services. The language was very important. As you know, everything you read is a whole different language than what the rest of the world uses. Not um, in most cases because it needs to be, but because we've created this situation. Historically, it's been very labor intensive. We perform the work with no necessary regard to client objectives or the value provided, but with digging into every single possible solution and answer and challenge. There was no such thing as budgets or price predictability, knowledge management. Those things weren't in a law firm's MO. And there was very little competition. So historically, very frowned upon to poach clients from other law firms. Um, and a lot of lawyers believe their credentials and intelligence entitled them to success. Whereas in entrepreneurship, we know business is about something completely different, and it's a little bit, little bit more determined on your merits. Um, I love this, this photo of a lawyer. It's you know probably about 70 years old, um, and it comes from this hard work that you did to get here, and believing that having a law degree and having done well academically and having worked with a prestigious firm or in a prestigious place gives you the credentials to be successful in anything that you choose to do. And honestly, every single one of you are able to be successful in whatever you choose to do. The entrepreneur is definitely a very different animal. So when we think entrepreneurship, we think of this picture oftentimes of a startup or a place where we have these big quotes on the wall that says teamwork makes the dream work or things like that, very different than a very old fashioned office with a lot of books and certifications. A lot of times entrepreneurs don't pay themselves because they need to pay their employees first. They may need to lay off employees when their business slows only to rapidly scale up again when they get busy. They often spend extra years living frugally to get a business off the ground and when it does start, we may be extra motivated to succeed because we've experienced failure in the past and want to prevent it from happening again. Which is a little bit different as well because coming to law school, the vast majority of us um, build up a significant amount of student debt or spend a lot of money and time not working and earning other income. And so lawyers traditionally are known as lacking the hunger that entrepreneurs and business people have because they haven't failed as much. So when they get in the ring in business against other entrepreneurs, it sometimes can lead lawyers to be less effective than their counterparts because they're not as hungry, they don't put as much thought into things like how hard they need to work, how they'll manage things, um, how they'll keep costs down, how to be aggressive at marketing, how to continuously improve and innovate, and instead of looking backwards, be very much looking forward. While it's not true across the board, lawyers are notoriously poor marketers. How many people have seen a really bad ad for a law firm? Everybody, right? Um, many of the largest law firms view marketing as undignified right? We don't need to sell our services. It's beneath us. The message is the reputation quality of the work should be all the marketing you need. But that's not true in 2018. Most attorneys are often not the best managers. So for those of you who didn't go to business school, how many of you have taken courses on how to manage people? Very few, right? Um, it's not something we learn in law school. It's not something we're trained in. Outside of that, and often as soon as you leave law school and start practicing law, you're managing someone. Um, as a consequence, most law firms are led by lawyers who have no training in business or management. The way you're taught to think and see the world and operate as a lawyer shuts down nearly every entrepreneurial instinct. Our job and what we're taught is to forecast every conceivable thing that can go wrong for your client and then protect them against it. To remove ambiguity and uncertainty. With whatever time you've got left, you focus on the legal structure in place to maximize the upside. But that's nearly always secondary to protecting against the downside. In part because it's more easily quantified, and it's because what clients hire to you to do, and if you miss a risk and things go south, you're going to share the blame or take all the blame for the hit. 
So this kind of failure mindset is key to a job as a lawyer, but a total disaster to the role of an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs need to understand risk. They need to understand uh, need, desire, possibility. But they also need to be pathologically optimistic. That's not something that's trained into you as a lawyer. Um, you need to believe the impossible can be done on almost an irrational level. Don't get in the water with sharks, but at the same time, you need to think, if I did, I'm going to survive. Uncomfortable, um, uncertainty, ambiguity, the unknown is just day-to-day -day in entrepreneurship. And so it was really um, interesting when we saw, I say when we saw, I'm old, but I'm not that old, the first wave of legal innovation in kind of the 1970s. And Mark Cohen wrote a great article in Forbes sometime in the past year or two, and he had this quote I love, which is um, this way of thinking as lawyers persisted into the 70s when law, like basketball, entered the free agency era. And so we started seeing more recently all kinds of other legal solutions. I could have put hundreds on this slide. These are just, I know the girls from Prior Legal and Rocket Lawyer and Legal Zoom are one of the ones that are most well known. If you talk to any of these people, a lot of them will say they think like an entrepreneur, not like a lawyer. Entrepreneurs have to take risks that would make a lot of lawyers uncomfortable. Lawyers are tied to rules and deadlines, but as an entrepreneur, you don't know what your day will look like. Um, the guy who founded Rocket Lawyer, Charlie Moore, says, you know, you have a lot of similar skills in both fields, including tenaciousness and resourcefulness. Telling clients you can't do that is probably the easiest advice to give as a lawyer, and certainly there are many times when I had a client call and say, hypothetically, if I wanted to do this, and the easiest answer was just don't do that. <laughs> but lawyers are those who figure out, the best lawyers are those who figure out how their clients can achieve their business goal, we're talking about business lawyers in that case, and achieve their objectives within the law. Um, Basha Frost Rubin, who's one of the founders of Prior Legal, for her, she said, lawyers have trouble sometimes seeing that perfect is the enemy of good. So many of us can be crazy perfectionists, and we need to fight the impulse to go through like 10 rounds of edits that have diminishing returns. So we're going to move quickly and be okay with done but not perfect. There's a lot of interesting um, research on leaving the law. So we know that a lot of people uh, who graduate law school don't practice. Of those who do practice, a lot of them leave within the first five years. And then there's a, a certain percentage of a group that stay in law for their entire career. That has decreased over the years. So obviously people change careers more often now than they did at any other time in history. And there's a guy named Harrison Burns that's written a lot about leaving law. And he says, which in some cases is true, once you leave law to start a business, you've pretty much kissed goodbye your career working in law. I don't 100% believe that to be true. I know many lawyers who have left practice and gone back to it. But if you do something that doesn't involve practicing law, the legal world is not often super welcoming in terms of welcoming you back. Um, it's like a guild is what he uses as an analogy. And guilds punish people for leaving them. So if you leave a guild, you better be certain you're doing the right thing. Um, and so he takes a very strict negative approach to this concept. Um, for me, I think about it a little bit differently. So 75% of lawyers who practice law are in private practice. Of those, 69% of them are in small practices, so 10 lawyers or less. If you're going to be in practice in a firm that size, you are essentially an entrepreneur in a lot of ways. You have to have some entrepreneurial spirit and skills. You'll be expected to learn through trial by fire. Um, you'll need to help in business development, promotion the firm, understand the firm's finances. And um, there are so many other types of legal practice right now that there's a really good translation between those. The internet obviously has leveled the playing field significantly. Um, there's a lot more news and coverage and openness about the legal industry, so people are more aware of trends. Legal technology companies have opened up a lot of access. But to look at it from purely the entrepreneur's side, um, Scott Walker is one of my favorite writers on that topic, and he says the number one reason entrepreneurs hate lawyers is because lawyers are deal killers. Um, because it's easier to say, you can't do that, than to figure out a way to do that. So his top ten, which I like, are lack of 
from 10 backwards, lack of clear and concise communication. We like to talk as lawyers generally. We're trained to have a full and well-researched opinion. Lack of communication, keeping clients in the dark. That goes back to what I talked to you about, like exclusionary language and um, keeping law in a place that's inaccessible by outsiders. Over-lawyering. So again, going through more stuff than is absolutely necessary. Poor listening skills. Listening skills are important as a lawyer, but sometimes we don't take a lot of time to develop them. In larger firms, often the most inexperienced person is doing most of the work. Um, failing to prioritize issues, going through the motions or don't gen genuinely care. Um, legal fees, of course, are often quite high. Lawyers can be very unresponsive because they're busy. And, of course, deal killing. So good lawyers are able to identify significant potential legal problems. Great lawyers provide solutions to them. And so um, thinking about that communication issue and how that goes, um, the guy who invented BitTorrent tweeted in 2010, so this is a long time ago, lawyers are like phone companies. Their bread and butter is to trick you into racking up minutes. And so when you go into the world knowing that this is often the perception, um, I want to kind of switch the thinking a little bit. So I'm going to quote Elle Woods from Legally Blonde because, you know, it's a great old movie. So she says in her, like, two-line valedictorian speech, our very first day in Harvard, a very wise professor quoted, quoted Aristotle. And this was the Aristotle quote. And she says, well, no offense to Aristotle, but in her three years at Harvard, she came to find that passion is a key ingredient to the study of practice of law and life. And so I want to talk about why lawyers should be entrepreneurs. Lawyers are able to avoid many of the legal mistakes entrepreneurs make. So as a lawyer, you're probably not going to go into a business partnership without having a written contract or some agreement in writing. You're probably not going to give a presentation without knowing you have the rights to use all the images in your slide deck, for example. You're really good at risk mitigation, which is a really important skill as an entrepreneur. Attention to detail is something that as entrepreneurs we often um, gloss over because we want to be fast moving and innovative, but attention to detail is good. Managing customer expectations is another skill that goes both ways. And careful communication. So all the reasons I just listed why lawyers shouldn't be entrepreneurs are also reasons why lawyers should be entrepreneurs. Analytical and sequential thinking. So anyone who came from science, I came from um, a molecular biology background. I worked in a cancer research lab before I came to law school. And thinking about scientific method, it applies both to law school and to entrepreneurship. And it's something that I thought was a disadvantage when I came to Dow and was surrounded by people who had studied business and political science and understood how the law worked, and I had no clue. Um, but this concept of whatever your background, using your analytical and sequential thinking, serves you really well in any facet. Negotiation is a huge one. I have a client working on a deal with a venture capital right now, a business client, and they're engineers. And so, you know, we usually kind of check in every day, but they will, without some hand-holding, give away the firm because they have no background or experience in negotiation, which is something most lawyers are quite good at. Communicating effectively or articulating and laying out an an argument with simplicity and accuracy is something that's trained into you in law school. Making a really persuasive written proposal to get your foot in the door somewhere is something that really comes from a lot of your law training. Confidence without arrogance is another really key skill, so hopefully um, you're developing that while you're here. Teamwork and leadership are both really important. And the ability to research, which is something I saw this morning in Professor Anderson's course, um, four students gave presentations. They were fabulous and inspiring, and it really strongly reminded me, because I work with a lot of non-lawyer students, um, the advantage to a law school training in presenting a really well-researched topic. Um, you have all learned time management and analytical skills. Those are critically important in being an entrepreneur. In entrepreneurship, if you have tunnel vision, you'll fail. Same as in law. You have to look at your competitors. You have to know those who have different but complementary goods and services. You have to forge partnerships. Successful entrepreneurs read a lot and read widely outside their field. And this is a critical skill as an attorney as well. Firms run by CEOs with a legal background are actually associated with a lot less corporate litigation. 
compared with the average company, lawyer-run firms experience anywhere from 16 to 74 percent less litigation, depending on the type. So what drives that? The need to fix problems and remove inefficiencies. Um, and it's fascinating because people assume lawyers want to litigate. But in reality, that's, I mean, court is a lot of fun, but you know as an outcome for your client, it's not the best outcome based on the time and the cost and the painfulness of going to trial. Both entrepreneurship and law are hard. Um, the guys who founded PayPal, the woman who uh, was the inspiration for Wonder Woman, Elizabeth Marston, she was involved in developing systolic blood pressure testing, which led to the first polygraph. These are all people with law backgrounds that founded amazing entrepreneurial endeavors. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to really examine your tolerance for risk and ambiguity. You have to switch from that perfection to done, not perfect. Well, a really small amount of entrepreneurs are natural born entrepreneurs. Most are not. Um, most entrepreneurs have some level of natural born drive for that, but a lot are just trained into it. In the end, this is what I've come to believe, the lawyers who make the leap and hit the ground running were somewhat entrepreneurs in lawyers' clothing, um, but it's as much or as little as you allow it to be. The other thing I always want to mention is that you can be a real entrepreneur without pursuing entrepreneurship full-time. Um, entrepreneurship can be a bit of an exclusionary club sometimes, too, and a bit clicky, and a lot of entrepreneurs like to shame someone who has a side hustle or some sort of hobby business, but you can be a true entrepreneur without <laughs> pursuing entrepreneurship full-time. So, this is like one of my all-time favorite quotes. As a lawyer, you need to think like that too, so that you're not necessarily just a lawyer. You're not necessarily just a business person. You have all these things around you, whether you're practicing in private practice, or you're working in a nonprofit, or you're doing policy work, or you're pursuing entrepreneurship. You yourself are a business, which is why I wanted to bring that up to talk about opportunities. Your opportunities are really endless. You can work as an entrepreneurial lawyer. So there's so many great new firms like Axiom and Elevate. Deloitte now has a legal department as does Price Waterhouse. You can be entrepreneurial and practice law full time, despite a lot of people who say otherwise. There's so many entrepreneurial legal enterprises. One of my friends just founded a company last year that's using blockchain to um, execute legal contracts. And so he's an engineer, uh, but needed to partner with a lawyer for the legal piece. Everything from like Robot Lawyer, Lisa, Rocket Lawyer, like I talked about before, Law Geeks, Doxley, all those are legal enterprises that are tech companies. You can start your own firm, which makes you very much an entrepreneur. You can work as a lawyer inside a startup. Um, obviously, legal consulting, founding a startup becoming a partner in another startup, buying a business yourself, and you're becoming a Dow alumnus, an alumnus of the Schulich School of Law. That is a super powerful network. Um, I noticed that the other listen expert uh, two, two weeks ago mentioned the importance of that network, and it's really true. I wanted to um, kind of double down on that, to use your network in whatever thing you pursue. You need to definitely Keep your non-lawyer friends, particularly if you want to be an entrepreneur, and meet new people and hang out with entrepreneurs. You need to read, read some more, and you need to really cultivate your mentor relationships. And don't discredit the amount that you've already learned and experienced because you, at this point, could already mentor others. Um, you've come this far, you have a lot of skills and experience and knowledge to transfer, and mentorship really works both ways. Um, so that's really important. I love this David Lynch quote um, because it really pulls into both law and entrepreneurship and just life in general in terms of everything that was made by anyone started with an idea. So for you, in determining a path, whether it's a career path or an opportunity or a one-off thing that you want to do, um, if you can catch an idea that's powerful enough to fall in love with, it's one of the most beautiful experiences. And so um, it's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about like designing your purpose. And 
How many times have you heard, like, follow your dreams or pursue your passion or anything like that? Lots. Once. Nobody. Yeah. Lots of times. Um, we hear that throughout our lives, right? And sometimes, lots of times, it's really hard to know what that means. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And so one of the key things is figuring out what success means to you. So when I talked in the beginning about that traditional path, that was what success looked like because it was what we were told success looked like. If you didn't become a partner in a large law firm, then you weren't a success as a lawyer. And that was just how we as a group judged that term. Um, for me, success means freedom. So that's my personal definition of success. If I'm successful, that means tomorrow I could hop on a plane and go somewhere. Or I can um, do what I'm going to do tonight, which is hang out with a bunch of tech entrepreneur friends while I'm in town. Um, does anyone have like a really great personal definition of success for themselves already? Yes? No? Curious? Ah, something really good to think about. One of the companies that I follow the most is called IDEO. And IDEO is essentially a problem-solving company. They're based in San Francisco. They've been around a long time. Um, and they work in the field of design thinking, which is essentially solving a problem using ideation. And so they talk about, as a kind of side topic, designing your own purpose, which is one of the most complex and intangible challenge of any challenges you could ever have because purpose isn't a singular thing. It's more of a mindset and it's a journey of experimentation and self-discovery. So you need to really know yourself so that when you're faced with a key decision, you know who you are, making it easier to decide where to go. So I actually work with business owners and individuals to map out kind of what their purpose is. Is it, you look at all the skills you have, what activities you spend your time on, what topics you care about, what you're curious to explore, and then figure out what can't you live without. Anyone tell me one thing they can't live without? Nobody? You're all good with anything? This is yeah. a terrible answer, but peanut butter. Peanut butter. That's a perfect answer. Just food in general. <laughs> food in general. Yeah, but there's always like something that's higher priority. Anybody else? No? Your phone? Wi-Fi? A friend, a pet. Nobody cares about anything. <laughs> Law school has changed you. <laughs> no, I guess sleep would be, more sleep would be good. But it's something we don't ask ourselves on a daily basis, right? What can't you live without? Where do you feel like you have the most impact? When do you feel most in flow? Particularly while we're in school, we are singularly focused for the most part, right? you get to the next thing, you have milestones and objectives and deadlines. Um, so taking some time to think about that. Spending some time on an idea list, which is somewhere between a to-do list and a bucket list, so not either. It's aspirational, but it's also kind of near-term intangible. It's really helpful too. So you can write down the things you want to accomplish and then just pick one and make a plan to get it done. Sharing what you want to do is also really helpful. So there's a law student um, at another law school that's a friend of mine from entrepreneurship. She decided to go back to school, and we talk all the time about what she wants to do when she's finished because day-to-day, week-to-week, it's something different. So she messaged me two nights ago and said, I think I want to do an LLM. Like, you're in your first term. <laughs> but it's because she spends a lot of time thinking about this, like, where do I want to go with this? And what inspires me? And what am I passionate about? So we talked about what she's going to do is actually reach out to some people who practice in that area. And within a day, she heard back from someone that said, yeah, just come hang out with us, like learn a bit about this topic. So she can see what it is, feel, get a feel for whether it's a good fit or not, and have some ideas. But without sharing that, it would, she would have kept it internal. And it's, it's really good to share. And you need to really balance action and reflection. And those, those things are really important, whether it's in law or entrepreneurship. Um, the other thing is talking about our difficult stories, whether you're a lawyer or an entrepreneur. Brittany Brown is an amazing woman who writes a lot about um, 
failure and success and uh, personal challenges. Often, particularly as entrepreneurs, we're a bit better at this than as lawyers, we d attempt to disown our difficult stories to appear more acceptable or more whole. Um, certainly, as a lawyer, I wouldn't have broadcast the fact that I have lots of tattoos and I don't wear nice shoes most of the time. Um, and those are very minor things compared to when we talk about mental illness or other particular life challenges. But our wholeness depends on the integration of all of our experiences, including the falls. It's so important. Difficult roads lead to beautiful, lead to beautiful destinations. And so as lawyers, we need to talk more about mental health. We need to talk more about addiction. We need to talk more about inclusion and um, this is such a good time with entrepreneurship that both fields struggle with this. Both fields lead to significant challenges in mental health, and both fields are well known for having high numbers of people with mental illness, depression, anxiety. Um, and so I think it's a way that as a lawyer or an entrepreneur, you can really think about um, what you want your life to look at without trying to disown um, your negative experiences. One of the best things about entrepreneurship is that failure is celebrated. We have a thing with our students at Memorial that's called a fail tale cup. And you actually win money for being the biggest failure that term um, because you tried. And you got a good story about trying and failing. Um, we need to do a little bit more of that in law, not obviously to a client's detriment, but in terms of learning and trying things and experimenting. Um, I want to leave a lot of time for questions, but, you know, in wrapping up, I think about figuring out your mission and doing our mission at Jellyfish is to do good work with good people for good people. So our work is good. We want to work with good people and we only want to work for good people. One of the joys of being your own boss is you can choose who you work with and who you don't work with, which is great. And we have our list of priorities in the wall at the office, which is everyone's pets internal employees and then clients because if you don't look after what's most important you can't be successful on the outside and my favorite favorite um, mantra personally um, and I give talks on this all the time is called woo bar so it's wake up be awesome and repeat so you've got multiple ways to reach me I want to leave tons of times for time for questions and discussion about entrepreneurship career opportunities alternate paths and happy to chat with anyone anytime here, offline, wherever. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Sure. Do you find it more traditional that like, people you see go out of law school and have this idea of entrepreneurship or really want to do it go straight into something like that? Or start with a more traditional route and then realize it's not for them and then jump into something like um, I don't think there's more uh, defined one or the other. It really depends on how much you know what you want to do or how much you know you don't like something or know what you don't want to do. So for me, I practiced law for 10 years. That was really unexpected because I actually didn't intend to do that. Time flies. Um, and I wouldn't change that for the world. It was an excellent experience. I worked with amazing people and got so much training not just in law but in life and entrepreneurship um, but I have lots of friends who never practiced who just use their law degree as a stepping stone for other things and that's I think the beauty of a law degree is the doors that it opens yeah yeah you talk a bit about how lawyers tend to be more skeptical and entrepreneurs tend to be as skeptical um, I'm curious though when or how do you know when your skepticism actually is I think you don't. Um, I think that's why science is interested in studying those kinds of things. Um, there's probably more in-depth like neurological research that I'm not up on in that field. But I think um, to some extent it becomes obvious to you with time that skepticism is either justified or is just part of your nature. Um, you know, everyone has that one friend who's just like jaded about everything, skeptical about everything that's just in their nature. Everyone also has that one friend that is 
ridiculously optimistic about everything and all the rest of us are kind of somewhere in between and I don't think there's a way to know and I think that's one of the great things about you know entrepreneurship and using a, a startup model of lean startup where you just prototype test it fail move on prototype test iterate which I think you can do in any field um, of knowing what works and so instead of deciding whether your skepticism is justified it's testing it and seeing it's just my thoughts on it <laughs> questions yeah you mentioned uh, student debt earlier in your talk um, I'm just wondering how you swing that move from you know financial security and a stable legal job into you know being an entrepreneur for the first few years that's an excellent question um, in terms of student debt and leaving something financially secure, um, in my mind, nothing's actually really secure anymore. It used to be, uh, certainly, so I graduated university, my undergrad, 20 years ago and started working for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And this federal government job out of an undergrad biology degree was like the best thing ever, right? Um, very much unionized pay finished work at 3.30 every day. This was some people's kind of holy grail. Um, but those jobs went away. And so something that's secure um, is a bit of a fallacy. But for me, yeah, it was a big choice. It was a big choice to come to law school. I quit a job in research to, to go back to school and incur debt. Um, and then to leave law and go to entrepreneurship. I think it comes down to happiness and your definition of success because financially it is exceptionally painful um i talk to startup founders every day i have it's uh, this is probably the first year i've paid myself in at least three years so you have to be comfortable with um a lot of your peers thinking you're a bit crazy i go to my lawyer's friends houses and they have all kinds of nice things so i'm like yeah i'll get there eventually um because i'm so happy doing what i'm doing so you have to pay the bills, and sometimes, particularly as entrepreneurs, that means working while also working on your passion. So it's why I talk about like side hustles and other kinds of business of managing both while you get to a place where you're able to do that. But it's a real challenge, and it comes with that comfort level with uncertainty and not being financially stable because you're so passionate about solving the problem that you're working on. There's no good answer because... Um, anything even that looks like an overnight success in entrepreneurship really took a long time. So it's the willingness to live very poorly to get to where you want to be. Yeah. Just to add on that, in terms of going through that traditional road and kind of going as a law student, yeah. you know, um, is there a certain gap between one of those two traditional ways you should be making the best strategy of the thing you want to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone has an opinion on that. If you Google that, there's hundreds of articles saying, leave at this point, think about leaving at this other point. To me, it's just really personal. I don't, to me, there is no right answer. Um, I know a lot of people who call themselves seniorpreneurs who didn't start a business till after they retired from their lifelong career. There's no right or wrong. It's really about what makes you happy. Um, one of the best written articles I've seen talked a lot about how when they finally realized that they weren't passionate about solving their clients' problems and they were just going through the motion, that's what triggered them to leave because when you looked at that list of why entrepreneurs <laughs> don't like lawyers and one of the biggest things was if they felt that they didn't care about their problem, um, they interviewed a number of lawyers who said, yeah, you know, I'm kind of stuck, stuck in this. And I made this career for myself. I'm not leaving, but I don't care. It doesn't make me happy. I dread going to work. Um, that's definitely an indicator that maybe you should do something else, but it's whatever's right for you, which, again, is not an answer, but that's a lot of law, right? It's all gray. <laughs> yeah? I mean, in the side hustle, you know, there's been paid a lot of steam in it, and a lot of other professions and businesses. Do you think it's sort of been the creation like, of the practice? Yeah, it's definitely a lot slower for um, law to accept side hustles. 
it's funny because I did a talk on side hustles last year and um, didn't realize the controversy even that term created because there were a lot of craftspeople who found the term side hustle offensive because they felt like it didn't fit their side business. Um, so whatever you want to call it. It's, it's slower in law because certainly as an article student and as a lawyer, depending on where you practice, there are regulations around having another job or another business, right? So it's important to consider those. I think that's one of the reasons why it's been a lot slower to infiltrate than other professions. The other thing um, I think is that a lot of it is tied to this reputation piece of being a lawyer in that more traditional environment and how what you do outside of work affects the perception of your professionalism and your ability to um, be a lawyer. I mean, when I started the first time I went to court, it was still required that if you wore brown shoes, the judge wouldn't talk to you. So things have changed a lot, but you can see where we're coming from is quite different than a lot of other professions. Um, I have a colleague that graduated from from here the same time as me and she runs a very successful food blog and we talk a bit about this concept of like entrepreneurship and and law and how it works for her in her side business but she's she works as an in-house counsel so it's a little bit different so I think it's um it's evolving like anything but law is definitely slower we're an old very traditional profession as a whole we've evolved significantly but it's much slower and a lot of that has to do with regulation Um, great presentation, very real. Um, I just wanted to ask, so like coming from, you know, you talk about like going right into it, but coming from a degree where you, know, you don't do anything really differently, but like you have the drive and like, you know, you want to do it, you have great ideas, what not, coming from say like marketing, etc. but you aren't really into like the finance aspect, that, do you think that that like is a disadvantage or like, would you, I guess maybe like an example of people who you know you talk a lot about like tech people and whatnot, but if you're not that person, but you're very interested in doing something like this, um, what kind of the, what, what does that group look like, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's me, essentially. Um, I think coming from any background, you can be a great entrepreneur. The key is to understand and accept that you don't know everything and that you need other people. So when I have anyone call to get advice about starting a business, I always talk about your A-team. You need an accountant, you need a lawyer, you need an insurance person, you need like a prior bookkeeper. These are the people that need to do those things. If one of those is your thing, great, you can cover that. But otherwise, whatever that laundry list of things you need to do to run a business, you need to rely on others. As uh, particularly an early stage entrepreneur, you need to learn a lot of that stuff yourself because you can't afford to hire for all of those positions. You're not going to have a chief marketing officer day one unless you have a lot of cash in the bank that you want to burn for no reason. Um, you're going to need to understand, especially when you're hiring people, that you're able to understand what they're doing. So I'm not a technical person, but I know enough about the technology that I can have a conversation with technical people. And those are all the things you pick up as an entrepreneur, those cross skills. For me, I felt like um, I didn't have any experience in accounting, marketing, um, business at all. I'd never taken even so much as one business course. So I went back and did a, my master's in technology, entrepreneurship and innovation. And for me, that was really helpful because I felt like I got that educational piece. We learned startup metrics and startup finance and a lot of business things that I didn't have, but you can learn those quite easily. We have evolved to a society where a lot of education is open and accessible online. When you look at, um, MOOCs and online courses, there's so much you can learn and teach yourself through those things. But to me, it's all about using the people around you, right? So talking to other people, I think there's no barrier really to starting something that you want to start just because you don't have those pieces of expertise. Then you figure out the path that's best for you. I have seven entrepreneurial work term students this term. Um, six of them are engineers and one is a business student. And um, they all are required to do either a course in entrepreneurship to take a program at an incubator 
or to do a Udacity course online. And all of those things, it just depends on what works for them and how they learn and what they want to learn and who they want to learn from. But they're all getting those skills from those different places. Any other questions? No? No questions? Sure. Well, I'd just like to thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. I know it thank definitely you. gave me a lot of uh, new career paths that a law degree could take me on. So uh, thank you so much, and thank you for everyone for coming here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks.